Welcome to Winners Wallets and Worldviews, a podcast on business, leadership, and life. Today, we have Gareth Evans on the show, CEO and founder at Vecta. Gareth is committed to a mission of empowering businesses and communities to make a global transition towards a more affordable, secure, and renewable energy future. Gareth has been a leader his entire life from working in charity and community organizations, leading sports teams to military operations. Gareth has paralleled these experiences in the building teams and businesses who challenge the planet's greatest challenges and opportunities. Today, we talked about the future of sustainability, where entrepreneurs and innovators and business leaders can find opportunities in sustainability, where the future of energy is going, and how you can get involved. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews, the only show that's going to teach you how to be somebody. Thank you again. Appreciate your time. We're going to talk about the story of Cypress Semiconductor called Zero to a Billion. I mean, you're not going to make it. It's not like being a star quarterback. You guys are all leaders. You, you guys are trying to crush it. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever's going on in your life, you're going to run into that block. Recognize that you're leaving 95% of American business completely behind. You guys are here learning, getting education. You're going to run into someone standing there. No, no. Michael Jordan's humility is what we're talking about. Saying to you, you're not good enough to get through to the other side. And I say to you, let's roll, baby. Let's roll. Thank you for uh, jumping on the show today. I wanted to uh, just ask you a little bit about kind of your background, your upbringing, um, and what kind of led you into, you know, kind of the, the sustainability space as far as uh, different types of opportunities we might see coming up in the market. Yeah, no, great to be here. And thanks for having me. Um, as you can tell, not a, not a U.S. accent, uh, currently based in San Diego, but originally from uh, Liverpool, England, um, and always had a passion for the environment and sort of uh, the world around us, always very adventurous, got to do lots of cool stuff. I've managed to travel all around the world um, through work and pleasure and done some crazy things. Um, I'm man training with Shaolin Monks, adventure races, um, mountain bike motorbike you name it so what's like what's like the wildest like what's like the wildest adventure you did <laughs> i'd say um probably at the age of 18 not really knowing what i wanted to do and heading off to south america to do three months charity work and this was back in the day of uh no mobile phones just a lonely planet guide and a few canisters <laughs> of film and uh heading off and um yeah sort of spending three months in southern chile uh, trekking all around the Patagonian ice sheets, doing community buildings. So we were building herb drying buildings for the local community so they could sell their products legally. And then we were also doing environmental research, looking for evidence of big wildcats in the national parks to prevent a road being built through there. And then spent another three months traveling up through Chile, Bolivia, Peru, and uh, got to do some amazing things. Um, but while we're on that topic, I actually, for the first time, I've done some crazy things. I, I've worked in places like Iraq, but it was only the, the first time I've had a gun pointed at me about two weeks ago when I was motorbiking down in Baja. And we came in, we rode into a ranch and the local ranch hand didn't like it. and rocked up with a, a rifle and a mask on and uh, asked us to leave. And this was just, this was rec this, this was recently now? Literally just uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> so you've been all over the world and uh here it is right there in good old california right literally in our backyard yeah exactly yeah right on man well cool well so 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 you're you're cut you were kind of an adventurer in your in your youthful days um tell me more about that yeah i was always um like mom and dad were both police officers actually when i was growing up and um we were always brought up not to really uh go after materialistic things. It was all about the experiences and the adventures. So we always, as a family, did a, a nice family vacation each year. And then when I was nine, my dad took a role in the Caribbean. So we spent two years living out there and he was doing some police work. And that gave me a real nice perce you know, perspective on living in a completely different country or different environment, surrounded by completely different looking people, different culture, different perspectives, the vulnerabilities of living on an island, you know, that you know, these things compounded into um, how important it is that we kind of look after ourselves and each other and we build the right infrastructure such that we don't get impacted. Um, and so all which, these... Which, which island was that in the Caribbean? It was Tortola. Um, okay, it's yeah. the sort of capital of the British Virgin Islands. And 
I think it got pretty heavily impacted by hurricanes over the last few years. So I haven't been back recently, but at the time, very, very awesome place to be. And especially as a kid, you know, uh, lots of snorkeling and beach time. And we'd go out sailing most weekends and super unique opportunity, especially for someone growing up in Northeast England, where the, the weather price to that was rain, overcast, gray drizzle. So completely different lifestyle. Excellent. So where'd you go after that, after you were a kid? <clears throat> yeah, so then we returned back to England. I did all my sort of schooling there. Um, always loved soccer and rugby. Um, and then once I finished school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I thought I always wanted to be a fast jet pilot with the Air Force. I um, Most people don't know this, but I studied like physics at what we call a level. So that would be between 16 and 18. Physics, geography, and technology. And I did okay in technology and geography, but I've completely failed physics. <laughs> they gave me what was called an N, which is like A, B, C, D, E, F, and then N, which was like a near miss. <laughs> so they couldn't even tell you it was a, they couldn't even tell you it was a fail. And so I was a bit demoralized by that. And I I thought I'd have to go back and redo my schooling to be able to make it to university. But I ended that's when I went off and did that charity work in South America. And uh, kind of turned to the resilience piece of just not letting that knock me down and managed to get a, a position in environmental science at Lancaster University after the charity work. So spent a year earning money, traveling, grinding it out, and then did three years environmental science degree in Northeast England. So I think like uh, one thing, so I work with a lot of different entrepreneurs and business owners, and I think regardless on... Um, what people think is actually happening with the environment, there's clearly a a market appetite to create sustainability, to try to find different opportunities, whether it's uh, renew completely renewable energy, or to find those different types of market niches. Uh, where where do you see the trends going? Where do you see the opportunities, and how can people start to kind of like tailor their business models around that? Yeah. No, it's a really interesting topic, isn't it, Aaron? Because I think regardless of your perspective on climate change and all the, you know, these, what are perceived to be sensitive to topics, I think the reality is you and I, and probably everyone we know, no one wants to be actively um, impacting the environment. No, everyone right. wants to be able to enjoy the world around us. And so if we can all come at it from that perspective of we want to do the right thing, and we want to also have this quality of life that we've gotten used to. I think the percep the biggest perception that needs to change is that sustainability isn't at the price of profitability or lifestyle change. You know, these two things can go massively hand in hand now. And I'd say the biggest opportunity for that I see for business leaders and entrepreneurs is we've got the capabilities to go and make huge impacts, whether it's on energy, which we're focused on, whether it's water, whether it's um, contaminated lands, all the technologies and capabilities in the world exist. But what are the enabling software technologies and business ideas, whether it be commercial models, whether it be simpler, more intuitive ways of making informed data-driven decisions? Because I think uh, a lot of people have never thought about it. And so when they're, as a business leader, when they're approached with here's your options or you need to be reducing your emissions or you need to be more sustainable most people don't know where to begin or who to turn to or what's even possible and so giving them the intelligence to make those really informed confident decisions um that they're not worried about coming back to bite them um i think that's kind of the key to this is how do we enable them to move forward with that confidence you mentioned that um oftentimes like profitability and sustainability don't have to be at odds. Can you uh, maybe give a really simple example of, of how you, you see cases like that happen? Yeah, super simple example would be um, businesses all across the US right now are suffering pretty, pretty significant cost escalations for their energy prices. And so the business leaders are able to now build energy solutions that will power their business, reduce their costs while also reducing their emissions and increasing their resilience so no longer do you have the risk of power going off and not having an impact on your bottom line and no longer do you have to plan on annual cost escalations for your energy year on year because the utility has to 
account for their capital costs. And then in the process, you can reduce your emissions, which becomes a, a real benefit and bonus. So which you can actually then monetize as well. So you, know, you can attract better employees, you can attract customers, you can improve your stock price, you can market it for, in many different ways. Um, so you can do the right thing and save a lot of money. And you know, we're seeing opportunities for businesses to actually pay off these systems in, a, in less than a year with some of the amazing incentives in the market right now. And then for big businesses where, you know, industrial scale, they're able to save, you know, half a million dollar plus on their energy bills a year. And we're seeing right down to the local kind of small brewery level, you know, they can still save 50, 100, couple hundred grand a year. And these are quite meaningful amounts to operating businesses where, you know, today costs for everything are inflating. And so you can't control a lot of the input costs to your business, but energy you actually can, and most people don't realize that. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting because um, you used, like people used to think that way that that sometimes sustainability and profitability were at odds with one another, but in in many ways they're not. I mean, I, I remember this is probably like five or six years ago when I was I was going to hotels a lot and you would see the card that was then on the bed and it would say that um, due to our sustainability initiatives, you don't need to rewash the sheets every single night. Uh, if you're staying, it's the same person staying in the same room. Why do you rewash your comforter every single day? And I remember thinking about that. I'm like, not only is this really great sustainability uh, activity, but it's also saving them hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars across a whole Hilton chain by not having to wash every single bed every single night. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. You know, that's that's a great example. And you know, you magnify that out across now converting from lots of mini shampoo bottles to one central that they just top up, you know, it, it's endless, isn't it? You know, and that education piece alone is enough to, um, even if you're not making mechanical changes to your business, just changing people's behaviors, changing employee and user cu customer behaviors, they can all add, add up. And, um, yeah, it's a great example you bring. Yeah, it's definitely something I think when it comes to sustainability initiatives, it's definitely something kind of like uh, health, really. I mean, it's like you don't really no one really disagrees with this. It's just about um, our different areas of focus that you want to that we should focus on. Uh, maybe some company wants to focus on this area of the environment. Another company wants to focus on another one. I'm just curious from like your perspective, what do you think? when you look at sustainability first, kind of like defining what that means. Um, and then second, what areas of focus do you think are, are pretty important right now? I'd say the key to all of it is it's complex and there are so many options. And so I think you're right in the gym analogy, it's taking that first step and then having the discipline to go back day after day and reassess. So I think the first cho job always is you know, where am I today as a business? You know, what am I doing? Um, how am I operating? How much energy am I consuming? What water am I consuming? What's my waste output? So even just being able to quantify that, that's a bit of a mystery for a lot of businesses. A lot of businesses haven't even started down that track. So just really understanding what it, what it is you're doing today, then setting some good aspirational targets, and then starting to take you know baby steps towards that. And all these things really add up. And um it's a very exciting space and it's an it's an exciting space for entrepreneurs for people wanting to start their career people wanting to change the direction of their career because there's actually not a lot of um it's a fairly new industry only in the last few years that people have really started paying attention to it at scale and there just aren't enough people with the right skills to address it so those that do and those that are able to step out of you know what they have been doing and into these new opportunities there's huge growth potential this episode is brought to you by Magic Mind. Our friends over at Magic Mind have created a unique blend of neurotropics and mushrooms to help with energy production. So uh, the Magic Mind, it's a drink, comes in a little bottle, it's green, it tastes like a green drink, and it's only got about 35 milligrams of caffeine, but I'm telling you, it has unbelievable capability for focus. So the running joke in the office is that people come and they raid my fridge and they take the Magic Mind out of the office because it's really effective. Uh, I use it as a pre-workout. I also use it to help me break through an afternoon slump. It's not like coffee or energy drinks that make you jittery. It helps with prolonged focus, especially for really tedious, boring type of work that you might have to do or those things you just have to get done. So I'm a big fan of Magic Mind. Um, if you guys want to try it out, go over to magicmind.co and use the promo code WINNERS20 
to know that we sent you over there. Let us know what you think. Tag us on social media. And without any further ado, welcome back to the show. Yeah, well, uh, one of uh, my guests I've had on before, TJ Rogers, the uh, former founder of Cypress Semiconductor, is now involved with a handful of different um, ventures. And he's particularly interested in renewables. And one of his companies is uh, basically scientists figured out that if you could make a solar panel essentially several miles long and it could tilt um, with a certain degree of rotation with the earth, uh, that would have a significant improvement in how much energy would be received. And those type of calculations are going on. And I guess like what what I'm really interested in, I'd really like to learn from you, uh, especially today, is what is the future looking like um, for these different opportunities? You mentioned a handful of them, but just like digging in on a couple particularly hot ones, what would be something that that we need more founders in investigating this area or we need more funds going into these markets because there's going to be a serious benefit to long-term business growth yeah well for sure I, the energy transition combined with probably the digital transition so we think about it in so terms what of what does that mean yeah so we think about it in terms of what's called like the four for the energy transition so decarbonization, digitization, deregulation, and uh, decarbonization. And this is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. And so for businesses all around the world, this isn't something that's going to be a flash in the pan done in a few years. This is a multi-decade um, transition. And I think what is super exciting is we've operated in the same way for over 100 years now where we generate power at a central location we're pretty much at the mercy of a monopolistic commercial model run by utilities. So utility generates power, sends it down a really long transmission line. We lose a bunch of efficiency in the process. It gets to our business or our residents, and we're completely passive consumers of that energy. We don't know where it comes from, how much it should cost, even when we'll get it. And the real opportunity for everyone in this market is how do we really challenge that status quo and move away from that monopolistic model in terms of both technology and commercial structure and allow um, ourselves as consumers and business leaders to be more prosumer centric. So how do we generate our own energy? How do we store it? How do we monetize it even at a personal level? You know, am I able to um, sell my energy to my next door neighbor because I can store a bit more than they can? Mm. Can I donate it to my local charity? Can I trade it in for a product that I use in the market that maybe that company needs my emission reduction credits that I've generated. So how do we create these kind of easy, easy to use apps, leverage data, leverage oh, sure, uh, sure, sure. solar and storage before they've reduced in cost by over 80, 90% in the last you know 10 years. And so that's why they are now really viable as solutions. And so how do we take everything that we've done um, in a lot of other aspects of our lives and apply it to things like energy and water use and uh, waste use and uh, convert that into a real uh, business opportunity. And it almost comes back to, I'd say, to, you know, we started out our communities and societies as being very, um, very self-reliant. And we didn't have to rely on a big central body to feed us, to clothe us, to energize us. You know, you and I would trade, you'd have something I wanted and I'd have something you wanted. It was, it, was it was very decentralized in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I think that's the future is actually leveraging these technologies to really decentralize and break up this uh, the current structure, which it's easier to build a centralized system, but it's also way more vulnerable. It's also, It's got many more points of failure. We have far less control of it as consumers. And so that's the opportunity is how do we put more con more control back into our own hands and also yeah. uh, create benefits for everyone in the process. Yeah. I, I mean, I can think of a lot of different examples where I think that makes a ton of sense. I mean, if you're, for example, I've got a house um, in Florida that gets sunshine all year round, a uh, serious amount to put, to have in that case, solar panels would, would supply more than my house would need in addition to some others. So like creating almost like a sharing economy would be an opportunity with power uh, where you could have battery charging stations at individuals. There's an app that might link people up with a network, things like that. Um, take another example, maybe a, a mountain town that has running water and you could be looking at kind of like hydropower 
uh, systems that people could have in those different towns. Uh, maybe go somewhere like Hawaii or the Pacific Rim that might have access to volcanic heat. Um, and having like almost a, a network of these different tools, because as we've improved, as you mentioned, where you're assuming battery storage, other types of power storage solutions would improve. You could really just go plug in at these different places and maybe have a fraction of a fee and you've completely decentralized the model, right? Totally. And I think uh, that's the that's the theory with electric vehicles as well is essentially you've got a battery on wheels that's mobile and uh, can cruise around and not only can you be a consumer of energy that other people generate, but you can be a backup supply or a source of energy to others when you don't need it. So how do you create that really, you know, two-way communication of uh, of energy and resources such that we can, it just brings more flexibility, more adaptability, and um, we can we can trade it and utilize it as and when we need it. And uh, when we overproduce or overconsume or don't need it, you know, for instance, at, at our homes, you know, in your Florida example, if you're over generating during the day, but then at a certain point in the day when you, or, or your community needs energy, there's nothing to say that you can't on your app say, I'm happy to turn off my TV, turn off my air conditioning unit, et cetera, and here's how I want to be compensated for that. And you know, being able to then create this uh, kind of blockchain enabled transaction that you don't even have to think about, it's all taken care of for you, but you've got a, a simple interface at the front end to, to set that up. And I think that's gotta be the future for um, the biggest businesses right the way down. Yeah, you're seeing that a little bit, um, like in the example of the solar panels, like you can sell it back to the power company. Um, but I mean, I, that's not really getting at the idea of kind of decentralizing. That's just the power company kind of taking advantage of other solar credits that they might have available. Um, what do you like? Look, tell me a little bit. What, and this is part of what we need to disrupt this because the utilities also are changing that business model all the time. And so we just saw here in California, uh, they brought in new rules whereby anyone who a year ago put panels on the roof got compensated at a flat rate for pushing energy back into the grid. Now, if I did that today, I couldn't do that um, because they don't want that energy. It's They've got enough clean, cheap energy during the day when the sun's shining. So now they're saying, if you can store it and sell it back to me at a, another time, I'll take it and I'll compensate you for it. But I think this is the challenge is they control the economics of it all and how do we ensure that we're not at the mercy of this kind of moving target um, that isn't necessarily always aligned with our best interests i mean how do you even approach like how do you approach that problem when you've got these kind of large government bodies that seem to have interests that sometimes or sometimes don't always align with the best solution i mean how do you even how do we even go about this I think uh, we're starting to see the beginnings of the death spiral. You know, there's some utilities that are really embracing this, and I wouldn't say um, all utilities are are negative and not playing the game. Some are are really progressive, but there's a lot that aren't, and they're clinging on for dear life to their old school models, which is I deploy more capital, I roll that into the rates that everyone pays, so everyone's rates go up to compensate me, put more money into the grid. And because the grid is becoming older and harder to maintain, those costs keep going up. The more and more people that defect and generate more of their own energy and need less of the grid energy, this is this is what kind of creates a snowball effect because at some point they'll realize they have to support alternative models. Otherwise, they'll go out of business because fewer and fewer people are then needing those services and those costs are being spread across fewer people. So then the rates are going up even more. So more people defect. And then it becomes yep. a self-fulfilling cycle. So I think as with anything, you know, um, speaking with your your dollars and uh, that's kind of the, the loudest way to to protest or act or change behaviors. I, had a, I have some stupid questions for you because um, if you look at like, we look at kind of laws of thermodynamics and in, I, I was driving down, um, I was actually in San Diego and I was driving down one of the highways and I saw just a, a complete field of solar panels. And at first glance, that looked great. But then on the flip side of that is, do we know any like long-term issues with the heat that's supposed to be getting transferred into the ground? 
um, and cause and do things for vegetation, for plant life, for geothermal heat, but it's getting captured now in solar panels, um, issues that that might have. And then take that to other types of things. Like we're starting to see already issues with some electric vehicles and lithium mining and kind of the abuse uh, that's taking in other ways. And it's like, are we just kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul on a lot of these different renewable energy sources? If so, what would be really net pure types of energy solutions? You've you've hit a very interesting point in that an energy transition can't happen without a mining transition. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. And the amount of uh, minerals and metals that we need to facilitate the energy transition we're all talking about is huge. And we need a lot more mines, a lot more responsible mining, and a lot more sustainable mining in order to achieve that. Um, the challenge being is a lot of the resources are typically in um, countries where those regulations don't necessarily exist um, or that, you know, the, the communities aren't empowered to really drive the right behaviors. So it's ensuring that as a corporate community that we're developing these projects in the right way. I think that's why we're big fans of more of a distributed energy structure. So if you've already got a house or a car park, how do you put the resources there to your point before of, um, you know, we don't know what the long term impacts are of utility scale, wind farms, solar fields, and you know, what impact does that have on the environment? Um, so why don't we, or why don't we use the infrastructure that already, ex already exists? and uh, put technologies there to enable the energy transition. First of all, um, the, the solar field that you saw when you were driving today is still connected to a big transmission line. It's still, you know, we're still vulnerable to the tree falling on that line or a squirrel crawling into the local substation and knocking the power out. So you still don't gain the kind of operational resilience of having the energy generated right where you need it. Um, but yeah, it's a very complex landscape. I think this is, this is a big part of the industry opportunity is there's lots of pros, there's lots of challenges. How do we, um, how do we all, we have a value in our business co-creation. How do we co-create a, an energy future and a sustainable future where we can all thrive. And there isn't this kind of big negative knock on effect further downstream that we, no one's kind of anticipated. Yeah. It's kind of interesting that um, in a lot of ways we keep coming back to kind of classic old tools that we had before uh, really the industrial revolution. I mean, I've seen uh, people looking at wind powered ships and it's like, well, I mean, that's how we used to do it. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we're looking at what do we have for long-term power storage solutions? And uh, now people are coming back to the idea of kind of like hydro power storage where you would, you would power a pump that would pump it into a valley or something like that in a reservoir. And then as you would need power, you would use the hydro power from the pump. And a lot of European countries are doing that right now. Um, and it's like all these kind of things we used to do in the 1800s are now becoming, are we're coming back to, but hopefully with a new look to it, you know? That's yeah, funny how uh, everything goes in cycles, doesn't it? Whether it's businesses, whether it's technologies, uh, I think, you're spot on. You know, we used to use wind, water, sun. We're using it in slightly different ways now, but it's the same theory. And uh, the resources are there. It's just, it's just how do we do it at scale and maintain the quality of life that everyone's now become so used to. Meanwhile, bringing up the quality of life in the rest of the world without heavily penalizing them for kind of some of the benefits we've gained over the last hundred years of using more fossil powered. Um, alternatives. Do you think the reason that we don't see a lot of this kind of like decentralized uh, model for energy is just because of the raw barriers to entry to get into the space? I mean, I remember uh, probably 15, 20 years ago, I remember I was sitting in class and I was just, we were studying geography. And I just remember thinking if, if you could use the heat from the earth you know, to, to power, I mean, lava is extremely hot. It produces majority of our carbon emissions that we know of, like these different volcanic activities and things like that. Why can't we use that to create energy and steam? And I remember talking to one of my chemistry professors and he's like, yeah, it'd produce a ton of different, it'd produce tons of energy. And I just remember thinking, why don't we do that? So I was like looking into different companies to invest into and I found like a couple different pink sheet, you know, penny stocks that were experimenting with it. And since then, all of them have completely bottomed out. 
And it's just, my question is, why, why isn't this a thing? Why are we not doing that? Yeah, the, the geothermal is definitely an opportunity. At scale, I think it's challenging because uh, you know, some some homes do it. You know, I have a colleague who he did this on his home up in the northeast recently. He put in a geothermal loop of a couple hundred yep. foot well, and you know, uses it to to heat his home and manages uh, energy consumption that way. So it is possible. I think um, everyone just wants that kind of easy, quick fix and. I think my energy is actually one of those magical things that most people don't even realize what it is or where it comes from. We just flick a switch and it comes on. So I think the more people are informed and think about it and start exploring alternatives, I think that's probably the key right now is how do we just educate people as to what we do and how we do it and where it comes from and um, and make it really simple for people to understand and then get access to some of these options. Because like you say, I think you, we don't want people to have to be experts and have to go and research all this stuff. It should be very simple to understand. Like what is, what is the return on investment for me? What are my different technology options? Who would be the right yeah. partner to turn to to go and do that? And so that's really what what we, we are building sort of through Vector for commercial industrial businesses is, there's so many options, gas, diesel, solar, storage, wind, um, electric vehicle, charging installs. What configuration of those technologies would meet your business needs? Who do you turn to in the market to get the most competitive solution? How long will it take? What questions do you ask? How do you manage your risk over the next 20 years? So I'd say these are, how do we remove all that complexity out of the system and all that cost that's associated with thinking through all those things because then it will become more accessible to a lot more people yeah i i agree i think that having that frame of mind and looking at um how do we make this thing how do we how do we actually save people money because money talks and it's like if this can be a tool for profitability i remember i was like looking at my kitchen and i'm just kind of observing and i'm like i have a hot water heater that's warming up this water and then i have a refrigerator that's now cooling things. And then I also have a stove that I'm preheating for things. And I have an air conditioner that's running. And I'm thinking about what if there was something that connected all of those to where it was optimized, much like your 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 car engine and in an internal combustion engine is pulling heat off of to heat the cab in the wintertime. Really great idea, really great system. How do we create houses that might, you know, use that system? And like, I'm thinking about all these different things. And I think to your point, it's like, how do you have how do you have entrepreneurs and innovators like looking at all those kind of like micro differences and what impact that could make? No, exactly. And to your point, actually then quantifying what that means to the person who needs to buy it, you know, these are not insignificant costs. And especially right now as uh, costs are going through the roof for everything, being able to either reduce your consumption and or cheapen your consumption are super critical. And, uh, and I do believe the technologies kind of exist, you know, the, it, it's all there, but how do you package it together? How do you make it super simple, super understandable? How do you ensure that people don't have to uh, shut their whole business down or house down for weeks or months on end to put, you know, retrofit these solutions? Um, let's make it as painless as possible. Well, what what haven't we talked about? What should we talk about? What do people need to, to know about? From an entrepreneurial and business building perspective, I think all this comes back to having the right mindset and the right culture and the right people who are willing to challenge those limits and uh, push the envelope and take some risks. Because as you know, um, disrupting industries and businesses that have done it their way for a long time, and this is the way that we've always done it, that's the challenge is uh, how do we how do we create that culture shift and how do we adapt with purpose to ensure that we are really disrupting the status quo because while it has worked for us it's not going to work for us in the future and all these things are kind of the lifeblood of our lifestyles and our businesses and um, we can't do anything without energy you know our whole economy will grind to a halt so how do we get people embracing that and uh, and really bring in those innovative ideas that you're referencing do you think that there are um other pressing types of environmental issues outside of just energy, like for example, uh, water cleanliness or waste treatment and things like that. My wife's actually a hydrogeologist. So she looks at water resource resources and, um, yeah, I think that's going to be 
well, it already is a hot topic. I don't think we realize how hot of a topic it really is. Um, particularly out here in the West, water is a massive um, concern. You know, I think a lot of the groundwater that we've we've been pumping on for many years is now either contaminated or being drawn down significantly. Um, so how do we get access to this kind of clean water that we all absolutely need? For me, it always comes back to energy again. You know, we'll likely need desalination plants. We'll need more water pumping, more water treatment. You can't do any of these things without energy. So how do we make sure that energy is such a cheap commodity that it unlocks all these other opportunities? But yeah, water is a, a massive issue. And I think it's actually driving a lot of the conflicts around the world right now, whether we whether we like it or not, or whether we look under the covers as to what's going on. But water security, energy security, these are all uh, super important issues. Where do you think the, if you're advising someone on where to drink their water, where do you think the cleanest place to get it? Where do you guys drink your water? Oh, uh, we're, uh, we're pretty pragmatic and we just filter the tap water. Um, but I, I'm not an expert on that, so no recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't buy bottled water. You know, I'm not a big fan of creating waste for, for the sake of it. Um, where can people, where can people get in touch with you? Uh, where can they learn more about you? Listen to other shows or podcasts you might be on if they're interested in following up with your work. Yep. Um, I'm pretty act most active on LinkedIn and Twitter. So Gareth Evans at Vector. Um, and then our, our website, www.vector.com, V-E-C-K-T-A. That's a great resource for everything energy transition related, um, right from the topics you've brought up today. How do we mine more sustainably? How do we get the commodities out? What technologies does that convert into? And then how do we really deploy those technologies at scale? So if you're interested in that, check it out. And yeah, we're always looking for good people, cool ideas. Um, and customers willing to embrace the transition and create that kind of profitable outcome um, while being more sustainable. So yeah, if anyone's interested in that, hit me up. Excellent, excellent. Gareth, thank you so much uh, for your time today. This was wonderful. I think uh, hopefully we kicked around some interesting ideas that people can start to noodle and hopefully invest into our future and make, uh, make sustainability profitable and exciting for everyone. Yeah, good man, appreciate you.